Go live. Yeah. Hello all. Uh, good afternoon and good evening. I welcome you in this fifth edition of our degrowth webinar, which is um, going to be discussed on. De yeah. Hello all. Uh, good afternoon and good evening. I welcome you in this fifth edition of our degrowth webinar. So here we which is going to be discussed on. Nice. Yeah. Hello all. Uh, good afternoon and good evening. I welcome you in this fifth edition of. Uh, I'm sorry, we have some technical issues. Uh, Tejender, can you please check if you have um, YouTube open in uh, one of the links and then just um, close it and start again? It was echoing. Yes, it's all good now. You can start again. OK, so I go. I should go from the start. Uh, yes. Hello all, uh, good afternoon and good evening. Uh, today we are organizing a fifth edition of our uh, degrowth webinar series on degrowth and colonial, col coloniality uh, on exploring ways to resist the Western hegemony. So uh, this is organized by the, in the, in the, uh, in, in the collaboration with degrowth and environmental justice summer school is formed by the two sister project uh, summer school in Barcelona and in Can Decrix, which is the first part of traditional take place in the Barcelona, where students have explore and debate on collective work on uh, degrowth and environmental justice. So uh, we have uh, today uh, three. Uh, just to discuss about how we can explore our degrowth uh, norms understanding in co uh, in a, to counter the uh, the western hegemony actually so asis kothari gabriel and irish will be joining us in this uh, webinar and uh, I would like to introduce you uh, first Asis Kothari. He's a, a founder of uh, Kalpurich, an Indian non-profit organization working on environmental and social issues of local and national global level, where he uh, coordinates the program on alternatives. Asis lectured on uh, environment at the Indian Institute of Public Administration and has been a guest faculty in several other universities. He coordinated India's national biodiversity strategy and explain also. He served on boards of directors of Greenpeace and uh, internationally uh, different uh, other advisory. So he's also a, a co coordination team of member Vikalp Sangam and the global tapestry of alternative and radical ecological democracy. Asis has been active with a number of people's movement including Narmada Bachao Andolan and uh, Beach Bachao Andolan. And he has co-authored uh, more than 400 articles and 30 books, including Churning the Earth and a co-editor author of Pluriverse, a post-development dictionary. So I leave the floor for Ashish. Please go ahead. 
Thank you, Tejendra, Tatiana, and everybody else for this uh, opportunity. Um, I am uh, speaking from a country which is currently going through one of its worst ever phases since we gained independence, uh, where the COVID pandemic has uh, very badly affected very large sections of the population in the second wave this year. And where we're also seeing a uh, a virtually criminal failure of governance in dealing with this pandemic and a failure of public health systems. Um, so it's in that context that, that I speak uh, today and that's playing at the back of my mind because three of, uh, three of our colleagues in the activist circles died this morning uh, from COVID. Um, and uh, so it's like a daily uh, horror story that's, that's playing out right now. Uh, so if I'm slightly incoherent, it's because this is, this is there in the back of my mind. Uh, I'll share screen and over the next uh, 15, 20 minutes, try and talk about uh, what I've been working on in the last few years, <clears throat> which is looking at uh, both practical and conceptual alternatives to the dominant views or the dominant uh, system that currently is uh, prevailing all across the world and to look at how there is actually a pluriverse of alternatives that exist there and uh, the attempt to uh, try and uh, move against the hegemony both of the so-called development discourse but also what we are beginning to see the hegemony of the alternative discourse that comes in from global north so very quickly on the uh, on the on the bad news uh, we we see we have seen across the world and especially in the global south, that, that uh, in the form of uh, or in the guise of what is being called development and progress, we're seeing enormous levels of violence against uh, the rest of nature, against communities, especially those who depend most closely on nature and natural ecosystems and, and land and forests and water. And uh, a shift from what I call what used to be livelihoods, which were not jobs, but which was work that was encompassed within ecological, cultural, social spheres to what I call deadlyhoods, which are either the killing off of very large numbers of those kinds of livelihoods or the creation of uh, jobs that are separated from leisure and, uh, and pleasure in the modern sector. And what uh, I think are, are, you know, that's what the uh, famous uh, anthropologist David Preber, who died recently, called bullshit jobs, and I call them uh, deadlyhoods. We're also seeing in this period in the last year, year and a half of how the dominant systems are actually using the pandemic to either become more authoritarian, that's in, in that's nation states in many parts of the world, including in India, uh, or uh, profit seeking, as we're seeing with many of the big capitalist corporations. Uh, but on the other hand, we're also seeing people's initiatives in different parts of the world of uh, trying to get... Uh, trying to uh, gather themselves to, to create a collective spirit and actions for meeting the needs of people who actually are not able to meet their own needs, elderly, for instance, or those who don't have access to food uh, or health systems and medicines and so on. All across the world, we're also seeing actions, spontaneous actions of solidarity. And it's the second element of the response to the COVID pandemic that I want to talk about more in terms of what are the alternatives to the mainstream models of uh, development and governance that we have. Now, this question of other alternatives is partly dependent on an analysis of alternatives to what? And this is where I think it's very important for us to go beyond the sort of system, uh, the answers that the current system is giving us. Like if there is climate crisis, there's carbon trading or geoengineering. If there's a lot of waste being produced, let's just recycle it instead of actually going more fundamental into the questions of why are these things happening in the first place. And this is where we see that uh, one part of the alternatives is the resistance movements that have been around for a long, long time, but especially in the last few decades and the last few years, we're seeing a significant rise in uh, movements, people's movements across the world against uh, state domination, patriarchy, capitalism, casteism, racism, and many other forms of inequality, injustice, and uh, marginalization. And it's part of these resistance movements that we see that development is not the only game in town, that there are actually multiple different ways of 
of uh, of doing of being of of knowing and of dreaming this movement for instance this particular picture is from about 30 years back in india a uh, movement against two mega hydroelectricity projects in which the uh, in central india where the indigenous people there were saying that when you see the river they were telling the government when you see the river you think of it as electricity and power and megawatts for us the river is our mother and you see these kinds of narratives emerging as very strong alternatives in the various different uh, movements the civil disobedience movements the farmers movement in india right now the anti racism movements in us and elsewhere the movements uh, against the military takeover in burma the uh, youth climate justice movements and so on and so forth that this is the these are sorts of messages of alternatives coming out but at the same we also need of course to have uh, constructive alternatives for meeting human needs and aspirations especially where there is deprivation there's hunger there's malnutrition there is lack of access to justice uh, etc and in india we've been documenting hundreds of these examples we have a website which i'll show later which has about 2000 examples of these kinds of alternatives constructive alternatives that are that have emerged on the ground the same is across the world uh, we see hundreds and thousands of these examples this is just a small sample i'm putting up on this on this map which incidentally is very uh, for me a very decolonial map a lot of people when they see this map they say oh, why is it upside down and that's when we get into a conversation of the fact that uh, the currently so called normal upside up map is a colonial time map where europe was shown to be on top and shown to be much bigger than it actually is here you can see the actual size of the continents but, uh, so these these kind of movements are across the world and uh, the book blue rivers which uh, is in the talk about in the beginning and when introducing me uh, documents about 100 such examples from different parts of the world i'm going to give a few a very quick uh, uh, summary of of a range of initiatives in india and elsewhere that provide to me the kind of answers or solutions or responses to the current system which are much more fundamental and systemic this is a example from central india again adivasis or indigenous uh, populations in india who have gathered together in a very large area indian villages coming together as a federation first of all to resist mining and extractivism but also to assert their own self governance their own self rule their own cultural identity uh, their identity as as uh, ecological stewards of the forests that they live in uh, and much else but also at the same time questioning their own internal inequalities for instance uh, women have never been part of the decision making in the villages so how does one empower uh, that section of the population also so it's external challenge but also internal challenge that they that they're trying to meet and their slogan is that while we elect the government in new delhi and mumbai in our village villages we are the government and i'll come back to that later when i talk about the sort of framework of democracy that emerges from this across the other side of the world uh, this is the sapara indigenous nation in the amazon of, of ecuador uh, which i was lucky enough to go to before covid hit and uh, here the indigenous people are trying to sustain their own biophysical and spiritual ways of living with the forest and within the forest and with the rivers uh, but also dealing with the external world through things like uh, community led health tourism and during the pandemic they actually moved a lot of that online so that they could also continue it, interacting with the outside world and earning some revenues from it but at the same time sustaining their hold on the forests and their uh, respectful relationship with the rest of nature back here in india and lock and looking at agricultural situations this is a group of about 5000 women farmers who belong to uh, the dalit uh, or what used to be called the untouchable the outcast the, the most marginalized section of india's population over the last 30 years they have transformed their lives from one of hunger malnutrition lack of access to education and health and so on to one of, uh, complete not just food security but food sovereignty and this is a very interesting concept where they say that for basic needs we should have full control why should we depend on or why should the government have control over it or why should corporations have control over it so moving towards that and they they through that also transforming their social uh lives and the status uh, uh, away from marginalization to being very respected individuals and communities 
in the villages that they live in. Another example from this is from Western India, uh, an urban context is again of people who are most marginalized. In India, for instance, 30 to 40 percent of the urban population lives in so-called slums or spotter settlements, very poor housing conditions, very poor living conditions. In this uh, town, they have actually reclaimed their power to plan their areas and make them much more dignified, create their own housing, their own water security, and a lot of other things. And through that also argue that as citizens of a city, we should be at the core of decision making, not only bureaucrats and politicians. Uh, a very quick example from North. I, ha I haven't deliberately put too many examples from North because I'm sure my other co-speakers will talk about that. But this one I was impressed by because it's in the middle of uh, a capitalist society is in Copenhagen, uh, an area where uh, several hundred, several thousand people have created a commune or a community of living in which there is no private property. There is no private inheritance. There's a lot of things that happen in the commons. Uh, and there's a lot of the economy of the caring and sharing and local exchanges that take place here. And it goes to show that even within the, the heart of, or so the, so say the, the belly of the beast, these sorts of radical alternatives emerge. Going to uh, Central Western Asia, this is another extremely inspiring example. This is the Kurdish ethnic community that has tried to create a region, a very large region of relative peace in the midst of a region of extreme war and hostility and uh, conflict. This is the Turkey, Iraq, Iran, Syria uh, area from where there's been you know, millions of people who, have been, who are having to flee because of conflict. Now here, the, uh, the Kurdish uh, women in particular have taken a lead in creating an eco-feminist, direct radical democracy-based uh, governance and economic system, which has lots and lots of lessons for the rest of the world. Again, very quickly to, to the north, uh, but, but uh, what I would call the global south and the north, which is people who are disprivileged. So the bottom right-hand side is an interesting example of a worker-led factory in Greece, where every worker is part of decision-making, and every worker gets exactly the same wage for an hour of work, regardless of what is the kind of work. So it's a very revolutionary way of trying to look at an economy which is otherwise extremely unequal in terms of you know what people are paid. On the top left hand side is a social solidarity economy center called Distrasa in Lisboa in Portugal, which was extremely important during the COVID uh, pandemic uh, for the homeless or for those who didn't have enough food to provide them with not just that, but also with, with social relationships, with uh, caring and sharing. Now, uh, one of the things we also find in many parts of the world is that at the root of one of the roots of the problem also is the education system, because basically it's the education system which teaches young people where and how they should fit into society. And mostly it's oriented towards teaching uh, kids and, and youth that you have to, you know, the only way you're going to survive is to be selfish, to be individualistic, to want fame and money and power. Uh, and that continues the same system that we are. So these are alternative examples in different parts of the world where learning is brought back as an element of community life, as an element of living within and with nature and learning from one's own elders as even as we learn from other cultures and other people. And to bring back the original meaning of the word school, which in Greek is skole meant leisure. So learning with leisure and, 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 and enabling uh, the creativity of, of kids. I'm going to take the last uh, four or five minutes to see what's sort of emerging from this in terms of, as I said, a pluriverse of alternative uh, frameworks from these and many, many other such examples. The way we look at it here is that there are transformations taking place in five spheres of life, of course, interconnected, the political, the economic, the social, the cultural, and the ecological. I don't have the time to go into any of this in detail, but just to give you a glimpse of some of the kinds of uh, transformations that we've already seen. So democracy, as we saw from the example of Central India or from the Sapara nation in Ecuador, is not about going to elections. It's not about electing a party in power. At its most fundamental, it is about us claiming power where we are and being at the core of decision making, whether we're in a village, urban neighborhood, a school or an NGO or whatever it is. 
and then building on that you have to create uh, more accountable uh, systems of governance at larger scales but that has to then go hand in hand with the localization of the economy because without us as collectives also having control over our means of production also having control over over our consumption uh, we would be uh, helpless even if we have political radical democracy so that localization with the struggles for social justice is also equally a part of this and then transforming the economy into one of money exchange and profit making and so on but a really a relationship of caring and sharing uh, for instance recognizing the invisibilized uh, role that women or elders play in in uh, looking after children as an example which is never acknowledged in the formal economy but much else which then means that we have to uh, displace the current um, indicator of gdp which most all governments except bhutan use as an indicator of progress to bring in much more uh, elements of well being including the qualitative indicators of happiness and satisfaction and so on this also then means looking at uh, politics beyond our current nation state boundaries many of us in the global south face the serious problem that our political boundaries are a result of colonial uh, heritage uh, or other sorts of accidents of history Uh, whereas in fact they could be rethought or reconsidered along ecological and cultural lines so that you can actually create a much more ecologically and culturally sensitive based uh, politics which then also means we have to re examine our relationship with the rest of nature that human beings unlike what modernized western western modernity has told us human beings are a part of nature we are not at the apex of the pyramid which you see on the bottom left hand side but we are one of a circle of living beings uh, and we should have the humility to accept that so uh, in india a framework or a world view that has sort of emerged out of these many many examples goes back to an ancient indian word called swaraj which uh, badly translates as self rule but it actually means autonomy freedom self determination etc but with responsibility for everybody else's autonomy and freedom and self determination which means it's not the american notion of freedom where i can run my suv wherever i want and i can bomb a country if it's not giving me oil at the right price uh, but it is that yes i will do what i want to do and assert myself as an individual and as a community but full responsibility towards uh, you as human being and also towards the rest of the earth so therefore building an ecological and social responsibility into this So this notion of eco swaraj is uh, something that's uh, uh, in many different words and forms is part of the movements here in india but we know that there are similar notions which are either ancient ones from indigenous peoples such as many in south america and africa boin vivir ubuntu are the be- well known ones but there are many 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 more uh, or even from um, uh, the uh, the the industrialized world such as the banner where currently doing this webinar under degrowth uh, eco feminism and many others and this book blue rivers which is available for free pdf download i'll put the chat i'll put the link in the chat when i finish uh, has about 100 essays of this from around the world now what we are trying to argue in this book also is that just like development is a westernized notion that has that is that is a hegemony all across the world it has captured the whole world's economy similarly unfortunately degrowth with the best of intentions is also becoming a hegemonic work, word um and i have the most wonderful friends in degrowth i tell them quite openly and frankly saying that look it's not about degrowth in india swaraj in india or many other terms you never have conferences about swaraj in europe why not why do you want a degrowth conference in india i mean i'm happy to do one but let's do a degrowth swaraj go in river etc kind of conference right so this is something i think you have to be really careful about it's not happening deliberately but it is happening and it's partly our fault also because we tend to accept whatever comes from the west without uh, questioning um, so uh, it's really for the assertion of pluriverse and but yet though we have this very great diversity of world views and concepts and so on what is it that binds us together this is i think very important what are the differences but what are also the commonalities and i think it's this fundamental set of values and principles that could be the threads that bind us together 
whether it's degrowth or it's swaraj or goin vivir or rubundo or any of these we're talking about the commons we're talking about collective and not just individualism and selfishness we're talking about human rights along with the rights of nature we're talking about respect we're talking about reciprocity uh, we're talking about uh, autonomy and freedom and self determination about diversity so it's really uh, this and i'm sure there'll be other values that people can bring up which 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 are encompassed in world views of of uh, that celebrate life not that celebrate money and fame and power but that celebrate life which may be the threads that kind of bind us together and so let me end by talking about two processes that are trying to create the bridges the platforms on which we can we can get together this uh, vikalp sangam or alternatives confluence is a process in india that brings together uh, dozens or hundreds of organizations and movements to share to collaborate to build more of a critical mass and to do more collective visioning of what kind of an india we want that's the website i mentioned earlier there's about 2000 stories of transformation on this website and more are being added every day and then at a global level learning from the vikalp sangam experience and others such as kriyanza mutua in colombia and mexico and many others trying to create a horizontal platform of uh, getting these radical movements in different parts of the world together again to share to collaborate to build more of a critical mass and to do collective visioning so we call that the global tapestry of alternatives just began a couple of years back and uh, incidentally it actually was an idea uh, that i suggested in the leipzig no sorry the budapest degrowth movement so there is a, there is an element there's a heritage from degrowth in this which is very important um and so this is uh, already got about 30 movements around the world trying to work together in some ways to create this collaboration with that uh, uh i'll end this is just my email and uh, some websites which people can get much more information on but i'll put them on the in the chat for people to see so thank you rajendra that's it from me for the moment okay thank you ashish for a very illustrative presentation uh, uh before and uh, now i'd like to uh, pass on uh, the floor to gabriel before that i would like to uh, introduce him uh, what he is going to present is more about the how idea that uh, degrowth is a project in north or for the north is sometimes used as a attempt to move away from the euro set euro centric but this might be a trap so how can we imagine a project of global socio ecological transformation caring to think only about the processes needed in the north the case of work time reduction and trade show that the without putting anti colonialism at the heart of the degrowth narrative the south will remain as a blind spot so while colonial structure can also be a reproduce in a post growth framework as uh, as he has described about this concept that could be a colonial for a global south so uh, gabriel is a researcher and the lecturer in a department of sustainability governance and methods of module university vienna he is a phd candidate in business and socio economic sciences at module university and holds a master degree in environmental sciences and a degree in environmental management from university of sao paulo his master thesis investigated the mic implication of economic degrowth for the global south so uh, i welcome you gabriel for the presentation you are good to go thank you tajendra uh, thank you ashish for the great uh, exposition before it's an honor and a pleasure for me to be here between ashish and edis thank you so much for the opportunity to the organizers and uh, i think tatiana would help me sharing um, slides okay thank you very much um let me try to check on my time otherwise i just um, go wild um okay uh what i try to bring today uh maybe it's uh, um just uh, i I'm, i want to i want to propose think about the relationship between degrowth and coloniality or decoloniality 
from uh, through the lenses of an equal uh, of ecologically unequal exchange. Uh, I'm absolutely aware we can we can discuss the coloniality, uh, bringing in other elements of racial capitalism on patriarchy and uh, the ideological structures of coloniality and so on. But um, I think from I think there's something uh, strong uh, within uh, within the degrowth argument with uh, with with the that um, with ecologically unequal exchange and the social metabolic studies that can help us uh, to to go a bit deeper on what are the relationship what what are the implications of degrowth of the degrowth framework for the global south and on the other hand actually uh, also go further in the understanding of how the growth um, address the global south in this framework if, and if this is a, an adequate way uh, to, to address it. So um, uh, with ecological, uh, I, I would say that uh, international trade and then here uh, we, I would try to focus on the issue of, of trade to think of the coloniality. And, uh, and, and and about Western as a trade as this um, global manifestation of Western uh, hegemony that we are also discussing on how to challenge here. No? So in some sense, uh, international trade is uh, one of the pinnacle material manifestations of, of colonialism. No? And some social metabolic research often of, that is often used by uh, the argument for degrowth in the global north, uh, this argument uh, has have long uh, examined the, and criticized the structure of the global economy and the imperial nature of the global economy. So here I'm uh, trying to, to stay in this uh, global framework of, of coloniality. Of course, we can think of it uh, in uh, other scales, but I'm trying to keep our, this, uh, this reflection uh, strict to this um, broader scale maybe. Uh, so the major rationale for trade is precisely, is precisely the transfer of energy and other resources from peripheries to center of accumulation. This is the uh, structure of capitalism, that structure of coloniality. So these colonial patterns of ecologically unequal exchange, uh, they are just as alive today as in the rise of capitalism. They are just uh, renamed, they've been renamed uh, several times, and today we, we name it as globalization. So... Uh, they also they, they ensure this asymmetrical flows of land, labor, uh, in labor, labor embodied in trade, and other kinds of resources from uh, from the peripheral countries to the core countries. So this creates created and perpetuates a forced international division of labor that is justified and maintained by race politics, military power, and technological differences between countries. So if the only reason for trade is uh, this colonial nature is of an equal exchange, we, we can ask ourselves, can trade be decolonized? So colonization created this worldwide center periphery structure we observe nowadays. And this structure was built for the purpose of transferring resources from some places to others. So uh, to escape coloniality, my argument is that degrowth must address uh, thoroughly international division of labor. Um, so I heard many times uh, in the degrowth academic community that uh, the growth is a project in the north and for the north, but somehow uh, this uh, the global dimension uh, uh, of, of of the environmental crisis and uh, of, of how our economies are structured. Nowadays, the economies we are um, inserted in, they do not allow us to escape from this global dimension of 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 um, of the of the world of this uh, of the economic system. So, uh, so can we think the growth? Can we think of the growth as a as a project uh, in the north for the north, or should we try to address it as a world? system or world scale uh, problem. And then I think I would try to give you uh, some more uh, evidence about this, uh, uh, some more um, material, give some more materiality to this provocation I'm trying to bring. So the next slide, please. So 
uh, I'd like to start sharing with you uh, this diagram that uh, made me uh, to get interested in degrowth about seven years ago. Uh, it uh, was designed by Christian Kashner, um, the researcher that I work uh, with um, I'm the same my, my same department nowadays. And seven years ago, I saw this diagram designed by him, and it was one of the things that made me interested uh, on degrowth as uh, a perspective for uh, environmental movements. And um, what really got me interested in this framework uh, is that I've, uh, I found uh, so something that accounted for global inequality and the recognition that the environment that there was some uh, the environmental space occupied by the overdeveloped countries by the north means a waste of space of environmental resources uh, that could be used by countries where the material needs are unmet. So coming from this, uh, I think what Christian was doing this article, he was trying to join not uh, the growth with the steady state economy framework with ecological economics framework, uh, giving this emphasis to ecological economics perspectives. So. Um, Therefore, degrowth in the north and in this in this in this uh, framework, degrowth in the north opens environmental space uh, in the global south, and I became kind of fascinated with this model, and and I saw this idea repeated many times in degrowth academic literature, and I did my masters uh, uh, looking into this literature and seeing how this literature addressed the global south, and. This very idea of opening environmental space uh, is crystallized in the even in the introduction of the vocabulary for a new era. This uh, very um, um, the seminal uh, degrowth um, conceptual book with the uh, all those like a glossary and then of this vocabulary for a new era. And but of course, like any representations of, of reality, this is model is a simplification and is susceptible to, to, to critiques. And if we have a lot of time now, I would love to, to send uh, you to breakout rooms and we could look at this model and try to, to figure out how we could improve it to, to represent reality uh, in, in a better way. We cannot do that. So um, I think some of uh, some possible critiques to this framework is this uh, grouping of the global south and the global north as two hegemon uh, um, homogeneous categories uh, that are hanging in this in this uh, scale where the north tries to degrow to save resources and save environmental space these global resources while the south uh, is able to expand and consume uh, more resources and uh, um, um, increase its material footprint to address um, uh, social needs. Um, so this is one thing that could be criticized, the, this homogeneity of these categories. But I think uh, something that really, uh, after, after a few years and uh, other readings and other discussions I've been through, something that I found were really uh, uh, that really missed in this diagram uh, is understanding these uh, processes as separate entities. It's not the fact that they are homogeneous, but the, the fact that they are separate. You have these two extremes in the scale. And something that's definitely missing here, it's the, uh, it's, it's trade. It's the, the, and the flows of materials and resources and labor between these two spheres of the North and the South. So I think for me, one crucial concept that uh, is, is missed uh, in, this, in this model, that is the main model to include the global south in the degrowth framework is ecologically unequal exchange, is missing in this model. Uh, I'm not saying that degrowth doesn't address ecologically unequal exchange, but uh, I don't think that it's addressed in, the, in, the, in a way that uh, um, I think it's an equal, uh, ecological and equal exchange is addressed in a, in a northern-centric way from the perspective of, of, the, of the core countries somehow. So uh, in the end, in this diagram, for instance, seems like the growth and degrowth in the north is a function of how countries manage to draw a share of a pool of common global resources. And then, for instance, the territoriality of resources in, in in, in, in the globe is totally missed in this 
in this diagram. Um, so uh, recently, uh, the studies about uh, global patterns of an equal exchange, I think they offer some uh, graphical representations of how this uh, flows of materials and resources work. And I think it can help us a lot to improve our model for degrowth uh, in a global level or how the degrowth ag address the, the, the global economy. So next slide, please. So in this study, uh, in this study, uh, the authors uh, separated countries in in six groups, and more or less the same uh, with more or less the same populational size, and they traced uh, in world trade uh, how much these countries produce in terms of resources, how much they extract for the, the domestic uh, production, and how much they consume, and uh, and for in and. And you have like in this diagram, you can see, for instance, uh, in uh, and they, they separ divided these countries uh, by uh, not only by populational size, but also by um, income level. So, for example, in purple, you have high income countries. In blue, you have uh, upper middle income countries. Then you have separately in red China. Uh, darker blue, you have low middle income countries. And you have separate India. And Finally, in green, in the other extreme, you have low income countries, okay? So you have in the, in the top, the, the, for example, here we're looking at raw materials, how many uh, gigatons, equivalent gigatons of raw materials these countries produce and how much they consume. So what is interesting uh, in these uh, this, uh, diagrams is to realize that how high income countries, the purple ones, actually, are the, are the are net appropriators of resources from all of the other groups of countries. So uh, you can, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so we can see here that 34% of the raw materials consumed in, in the high income countries are appropriated from the rest of the world. No? And uh, this pattern, it's, repeated across all other variables they looked at. Can you please, uh, next slide, please. So we, if we look at energy, for instance, yeah, all the countries in, in, the, in global trade, all the, all the countries are actually uh, net exporters of energy and the high income countries are net importers of energy. So they, uh, they manage to appropriate uh, energy from the rest of, of the world. 10% of the energy consumed in, in high income countries comes, uh, uh, it's, it's from, uh, it's surplus acquired in global trade from the rest of the world. Next one, please. The same for land, 19% of the, of, the, of the land that supports this, this, material, this lifestyle in, in, in high income countries comes from the rest of the world. Next one, please. And finally, an interesting case that I think it's often um, uh, neglected in discussions about ecologically unequal exchange in the, uh, in the degrowth literature is uh, the flows of labor embodied in trade. And it's also the same. Uh, it's the same patterns of, of net appropriation uh, of high income countries uh, uh, by, by high income countries appropriating from uh, the rest of the world. So for instance, and then I, I, I like to mention the case of uh, work time reduction policies discussed uh, in a degrowth or post-growth framework. So there is this uh, recurrent idea that uh, degrowth in the global north uh, and having lower uh, production, uh, lower um, decreasing production and consumption would naturally lead to a lower uh, work time requirements. No, but in some other, uh, but on the other hand, the, the, the global north is already living on surplus of work time acquired from all other regions of the world. So if work time reduction uh, starts uh, right now in the global north, the global north would still be related, to, uh, would, would still be relying on 28% of its labor being uh, um, 
um, acquired in global markets uh, with labor embodied in trade, labor that is um, uh, embodied in any product we, we get from the, um, the production process, it's embodied when you, when you buy it. So uh, from, this, uh, from this point of view, the growth from uh, if, if we think of all these uh, resources and and, um, and labor uh, surplus that the, the high income countries managed to get in, in 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 international trade the growth in the global north uh, it's uh, just is justified already from a, from an ethical perspective as a as a anti colonial uh, device you could uh, you could uh, you could understand that if, if for, for instance, the growth can if, uh, let's let's take the example of um, of uh, labor for instance. If uh, the first step to decolonization would be that the, in the high income countries, uh, the lifestyles and the modes of living there could refrain from appropriating 28% of the, of the, the consumed work from all the rest of the other countries. And this is not balanced because all these uh, different variables, they have the same behavior to high income countries. That's what uh, allows uh, accumulation and, um, and differential consumption in these countries. Next one, please. So, um, so now I, I would like to address. Um, so, uh, is uh, one of the most progressive proposals from a for from a green for a green new deal, the green new deal for Europe, green new deal without growth. And one may ask, what are the material requirements for a clean energy transition in core countries? Where will these materials come from? So the new the green new deal without growth recognizes that these materials. Uh, would come from the global south, and um, they try to account for that and uh, ask for supply chain justice. You now, what is that? What does that mean to account for the social ecological impacts of of the materials that are acquired in the global market for a clean energy transition? No, just quoting here, it, it's, it, it means ensuring that materials required are handled with commitment to social and environmental justice in the rest of the world. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, um, one, one could ask if, uh, if, if, the, if the high income countries are already uh, 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 managing a, a net appropriation of resources in the, in the global scale, uh, even for a green, for a clean energy transition, the same patterns of eco, an, an ecological, uh, uh, an ecological and eco exchange would just uh, continue to take place, but maybe with a with a higher a social environmental responsibility on how the things uh, are managed in the extraction process and so on. How this, what the supply, the supply chain justice really changes the face of an equal exchange between countries. So uh, we could ask ourselves. Uh, not only where will these materials come from, but also should these materials come? Should they come at all? Next one, please. And to illustrate the po this point, uh, I'd like to bring this study. It's about the case of co copper. Uh, it's called Sold Futures. And uh, they present copper as a strategic mineral for an energy transition. Uh, but the scenario about copper distribution of stocks in, in use right now in the world is very already very uneven. So you have higher income countries. Uh, oh, sorry, it's inverted there in the slides. I'm really, really sorry. So in lower income countries, you have an availability of copper stocks from uh, around 30, 40 kilos per person, while in higher income countries, you have availability of from 140 to 300 kilos per person. So you, had already, you have already a very uneven distribution of these materials uh, between North and South. So uh, how can we think of achieving some convergence of metal stocks if we want to achieve uh, some uh, global justice, some international justice without increasing uh, the, the extraction of more copper? 
uh, it's stopping mining. So the only way we could even we could manage to do something like that would be to think of next uh, net export of uh, of copper stocks from core countries to peripheral countries to an actual inversion of uh, an equal exchange if we want to achieve some level of equality of uh, availability of metals if we want to ensure a clean transition a clean energy transition not only in the global north but also in the global south uh, next one please and then uh, i can i would and then i also ask what can degrowth demand something like that is, is, is it such a, a, a radical demand, like giving up, not only giving up on resources, but advocating for uh, devolution of resources to, to, to peripheral countries? So, like for instance, a clean energy transition can be uh, uh, realized in, in, uh, in a fair way in, in the peripheral countries too. So, uh, and then I bring here two uh, examples of movements in Brazil. Uh, that have uh, explicit claims that in this direction of sovereignty uh, over the use of, of natural resources of minerals uh, for the benefit of the people is the movement for popular sovereignty in mining. Uh, it's by people affected by, by, by mining activities, by corporations and by the state. And they challenge this primary export model and they advocate for the use of minerals for the benefit of the people. They don't have... Uh, in their discourse, the is not a default to keep my, uh, minerals in the ground, but the sovereignty to decide on what to do with these minerals, uh, to use them for the benefit of the people, or even leave them on the ground if that's uh, the if that if that is desirable. The other uh, movement, the landless, landless workers movement in Brazil, also uh, have a similar perspective, but not not uh, precisely directed on mineral resources, but uh, on food sovereignty and the understanding of exports uh, of food merely as a complementary activity. So we organize uh, the agricultural policy in the country to uh, supply and self, uh, self-sufficiency and avoid raw materials exports. So they are also challenging this primary export model. Next one, please. And this is my, my, final, my final remarks. Uh, uh, just about what kind of uh, strategies or agenda points uh, could figure in a degrowth uh, agenda that has that had uh, with a anti-colonial colonial nature. So I think two lines, strategical uh, fronts or lines emerge. So on the one hand, a more combative perception that in the north it is uh, responsib- our responsibility in the north to fight against colonial and imperialist projects that uh, comes from these countries through corporations and the direct action of states. And on the other hand, a more reformist approach uh, that stronger, uh, that, that entails stronger supply, man- uh, supply chain laws, fairer trade agreements and international cooperation uh, arrangements that uh, could be pushed to achieve a fairer division, international division of labor. So I mentioned here some points in this agenda, like unconditional debt cancellation, uh, technological transfer, open patents, which is crucial now. For instance, it gets uh, visible how, uh, in times of COVID, uh, how this, uh, how the patents on um, medical products and vaccines uh, slow and difficult access uh, from, uh, for uh, to to solve crisis in uh, peripheral countries when uh, technological development in core cultures is di- a direct result of primitive accumulation allowed by colon- colonial exp- exploitation. This differential technolo- technology, it's, uh, it's a, also produ- a product of coloniality. And the free tra- trade ag- agreements are already mentioned and stop war, occupation and imperialism. Uh, if we think about direct and, ind- that in- direct and indirect intervention on peripheral countries, is a violation of the right of self-determination and draws in the imperial principle of the right to intervene of the core nations. So either through military occupation, like NATO's operations in West Asia, or indirect use of influence uh, to provoke regime changes, as a, uh, for instance, a crusade against uh, corruption in Brazil that led to the dismantling of the Brazilian national oil company. These are crucial, as a crucial device 
to hinder sovereignty uh, in peripheral countries and keep the peripheral resources flowing to the centers of accumulation. So um, my final argument is that degrowth needs to fully embrace a world system perspective, uh, not only think about uh, national policies on, on how uh, to, to, to uh, allow further uh, well-being and uh, welfare improvements in a post-growth growth context. Uh, and this means to set a framework is this, uh, this doesn't mean to set a framework that to be imposed in the South, but the other way around, it means embracing the South and creating a framework for a social project in the North that fully accounts for its engagement with globalization and the international division of labor. So it's necessary to locate the degrowth framework in the real broader context of Western economies, which is the world system, not only acknowledging and embracing the consequences of, uh, of transformations with the South, only doing this, only ac acknowledging the consequences with the South, the growth might represent a truly emancipatory project and a natural ally for movements in the global South. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gabriel, for a very interesting and convoluted presentation. Now our third guest is Iris Borui. Uh, so she's going to present about how degrowth concept is primarily aimed at high income countries whose unused, unsustainable levels of production and consumption are most in need of change. This creates a special challenges for low and middle income countries where the desire for economic growth is understandably strong. So Iris will discuss the need for unfundamental conceptual changes in the understanding understanding of development, which requires facing inconvenient truths, both in global North and South. So Iris uh, Borivi is a distinguished professor at the University of Shanghai and director of the Center for the History of Global Development. She has taught and done research at various universities in Germany, France, Brazil, Norway, and the United Kingdom as well. Borwi's research interests include the history of international organization of global health and of global development. She has published about 50 academic papers and several books, including coming to terms with World Health, the Leagues of Nations Health Organization 2009 and defining sustainable development for our common future, a history of the World Commission on Environment and Development are some of the example. At present, she is working on a project on the policies of international organizations regarding waste. So I welcome Iris on floor. Please take the floor. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. I feel very happy being here. And I would like to share my screen if possible. Uh, no, this isn't it. Sorry. Uh, let me try this again. Can you see it now? Yes. 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 Okay, yeah, I need some feedback from you so that I um, know if I can go ahead here. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much also for this very flattering uh, introduction. And let me check my time as well. Um, since you mentioned already, I feel a little, I, uh, I, I felt a little unsure of what exactly my, my role should be in this since I, am, I come from Germany. So I am from the global north. I now work in um, Shanghai in China. And um, this experience means that to me, North and South really don't, don't, you know, they're not that clear cut anymore because, um, yeah, living here in Shanghai, it's certainly not the North, it's not the West, but it looks very much like it. So I was trying to make some sense about this in some way or the other. So um, the, the question that this was supposed to answer from what I understood was how degrowth could avoid being another case of the global North imposing its vision for the future on the global South. Uh, which um, obviously it shouldn't do. And so I think there is, it's very limited what groups or countries or stakeholders in the North, 
in the short in the, the north can do to determine how people in the south should live including whether they want degrowth or not or want something else um so i i think whatever uh, role groups in the north can play would have to be somewhat more indirect and um i would just like to contribute two ideas or two two concepts uh, about this that uh, to the, the concept of the label of development i believe that does have to be reconsidered and the idea of um, redistribution possibilities actually spelled with two s uh, should also be considered and this is what i would like to talk about so um this is the the conventional classification for developed and uh, uh, countries in development. So the UN categorizes countries at the moment actually in, in three parts, uh, the, the so-called developed economies. Those are mainly uh, European economies plus a handful of others, mainly Australia, Canada, Japan, New Zealand and the United States. There, is, uh, there are some economies in transition. Those are mainly those in Eastern Europe and all the rest is considered economies in development. So by implication, that means those countries are expected to become somewhat more like developed countries. You know, the implication being that those developing are developing to a state that is developed already. Um, there is a complementary, though a little different categorization um, that comes from the World Bank. Uh, which categorizes countries uh, according to income levels. So there is low income, middle, uh, lower middle income, higher middle income and high income countries. And it's something that uh, uh, Gabriel also used when you were talking about high income countries. So the, this is something that goes beyond the World Bank. It's something that in some way or the other we, uh, most of us use. So um, there is also the category of least developed countries, uh, which uh, is sort of combines those two uh, categories in that it uh, means mainly low income economies, um, but uses additional aspects. And it's uh, the, the UN Economic and Social Council that goes through uh, these categorizations once every three years and then defines which ones are those that are considered least developed. And um, to their credit, you have to say they don't only think about uh, per capita income, uh, this is one of the categories. So GNI, the gross national income per capita. They also talk about human assets. So these are mainly, uh, not mainly, these are health and education index. So under five mortality, maternal mortality and prevalence of stunting in the health categories and education, uh, gross secondary school enrollment, adult literacy rate and gender parity. And as a third column, um, they talk about economic and environmental vulnerability. Uh, indexes. So when they talk about the economic vulnerability, including things like remoteless landlockedness, merchandise export concentration, instability, and environmental vulnerability, the share of the population in low elevated coastal areas or those in dry lands, or um, instability in agricultural production and victims of disaster. So those are the categories which together um, according to the UN at the moment, define least developed. Um, there are some difficulties with that because, as I mentioned, if if everybody, all the countries have to come out of that into other states, um, this is this creates a world which is probably impossible. Uh, and I'll come back to that. Uh, and I would propose that. Uh, if, if we reconsider or redefine development, uh, the, the question is how and what criteria do we use? And there are several actually of alternative indexes that are already in the world uh, which could be used. Uh, so I'm not going to propose the one tier which I believe is correct, but I would like to um, just present a few that lend themselves to being used for that purpose. One is the Happy Planet Index that was developed by the New Economics Foundation in London. Um, which doesn't talk about income at all, uh, but uh, categorizes country according to how efficiently they use uh, en environmental mm, resources in, um, in order to create long, happy lives. So it's happiness, so it's a life satisfaction. 
self-proclaimed life satisfaction uh, plus health uh, measured as mortality rates or life expectancy actually uh, combined with uh, inequality measured by the uh, Gini coefficient um, by or divided through the uh, ecological footprint. And this creates uh, a totally different ranking here. According to them, this is the last ranking of 2016. The next one is in preparation this year. Uh, the, the, the highest developed ones, according to this ranking, would be uh, Costa Rica and then a number of uh, mainly South American countries, plus Vanuatu, uh, Vietnam, and Bangladesh and Thailand. So it's South America and it's actually uh, Asian countries. And if those are the ones that, according to these categories, would be most highly developed, these should be the models to where the rest of the world goes. So if you um, change that, uh, you know, according to these categories, uh, you would probably have to drop uh, something like the per capita uh, income. You know, on, on the left, you always see those that are being used at the moment, uh, not use the expert capabilities anymore and don't focus on assets and vulnerabilities. But instead, you could add a category for life satisfaction, the distribution and equality of incomes, and focus on well-being and justice and the environmental burden something that is not being considered at the moment. Another possibility actually is also being um, presented, exists already and exists in the, in the Northern world, uh, is presented by the OECD, the Organization for Economic uh, Cooperation and Development, uh, which has uh, developed the so-called Better Life Index, which is a, a complex, uh, which you can see on the right-hand side here, uh, which uses a total of 11 categories, including housing, income, jobs, but also community, education, environment, civic engagement, health, life satisfaction, safety, and work life balance. So different countries come up with something that looks like little flowers over here, uh, depending on how well they perform in these um, categories. The interesting thing about these is also that um, the idea is not that every country should use the same, um, but this is an ongoing project and um, everybody with an internet and interest can actually take part in that and, um, and submit, fill in um, his or her uh, individual preferences. And many countries have done that. This is not representative in the sense that, you know, scientific representative numbers of people in each country have been asked, but a lot of people have taken um, part in that so far, and it comes up with uh, different results in that in Mexico, for example, um, uh, the, the, the people who have taken part in that uh, give education the highest ranking as you know, the, the, the most important value in this. In India, it's life satisfaction. In Australia, it's work-life balance. So the idea is that different countries would have different ideas of where they want to develop to. If you align um, changes according to the Better Life Index, there should be a focus on a broad range of issues, and I've listed them here again. And again, different emphasis in different, uh, in different countries. And I'd like to uh, bring up the sustainable development goals here. And I think these are uh, interesting uh, for the uh, target 12, um, especially, uh, which is about responsible consumption and uh, production. Uh, and they highlight things that should be reduced rather than added. So while so far the, the focus is for development is of, for getting more of something, uh, I do credit uh, this goal for highlighting that um, part of development has to be of having less of something. So significantly reduce the release of air, water and soil um, is part of the targets. Target four for this uh, goal, reduce waste, um, and uh, uh, reduce the, the, the use of uh, resources for production. Again, you could organize, uh, uh, could consider changing those categories uh, along those lines. In this case, again, a much broader range of issues uh, should be considered than those being considered at the moment. And also the focus on assets and damages, damages again being something that should be reduced. So again, what I find interesting is that it's, it's on the one hand, 
would be a fairly radical shift of understanding of development, but not radical in the sense that it doesn't exist yet or doesn't exist or exists only in some you know, very remote um, alternative universe. But this is being discussed in, in you know, very central organizations in the global north already or in the in, you know, in international. So um, you, from that point of view, you really don't have to make a very large jump. As the second point, and I see that this is to some extent in contradiction to what I'm talking about now, but I see it more as complementary, is to, to address the inequality that um, you, you know, the, the speakers before me have already uh, mentioned also. Now, even though development should take a step away, I believe, and I think you know, most people in the degrowth movement uh, would see it this way, uh, um, should not, uh, uh, be, be, I mean, the, the idea of development should not be based primarily uh, or even at all on the idea of, um, of income or of money. At the same time, if you look at the way the world is today, I think it would be kind of an eve to ignore this because the, the uh, distribution of wealth is just so grossly unequal that um, it, it, to my mind, it just has to come in there to some point. So th this is the global pyramid of wealth. Um, this is to some extent an, ex uh, an, an estimate uh, because it's, I don't think anybody really knows exactly uh, what the distribution is, but as just, just to give us an idea according to this estimate, 70% uh, of the world population actually er um, own less than 3% of the world wealth and less than 1% of the world population um, actually own almost 50%. So, I mean, this is obscene. So something should be done about that. And the question is what? Um, so the options seem kind of limited. I mean, uh, presumably the poor people could remain poor and the rich could remain rich, um, but that would be unstable and also would be immoral. I mean, this is not something that we should have as a goal. Um, the poor could become as rich as the rich. Uh, which is uh, would require enormous economic growth and is probably physically impossible and it's not something that we need to discuss in a degrowth uh, framework here. So um, the idea should be that in some way the rich should share some of their wealth, um, which would also require some enormous redistribution. And in the real world is uh, politically or psychologically very difficult. I put almost impossible, I hope not. I, I see this as something without much of an alternative. And if this doesn't have an alternative, then I think we have to start thinking about how this could be done. You know, in practice, how could we do this? Um, there is not the time really to go into this in much detail. I have um, published about this at, at elsewhere. So we'd just like to, to mention some of the ideas that I think um, you know, should be discussed in this context. So there is direct redistribution in the sense that actually wealth from one side of, uh, of the global wealth distribution goes to the other side. So from, you know, it's, this is a, a little bit simplistic, but somehow going from the rich to the poor. Um, and there is uh, indirect redistribution, which I'll go to in a way. So directly, I think the, the, the first thing would be to end uh, some of the reverse redistribution that um, also um, the speakers before me have already talked about. And um, I, I didn't think about the material redistribution so much. Maybe I should um, integrate that now. Uh, I, I was um, talking about the, you know, thinking about the financial part. Uh, and their tax evasion is certainly, um, you know, a, a really, really important one. The, the the sums that are involved are just humongous. This is something that has to be addressed, and the environmental destruction that is going on also has to be addressed. Otherwise, the development aid and remittances um, they are both very controversial um, and uh, come with weaknesses, strengths, and weaknesses that I don't have the um, time to go into, but they are existing ways of redistribution and there are also um, you know, substantial serious stakeholders also in the global south that uh, argue that this should be not only maintained but should actually um, be facilitated and increased. There is a discussion about compensation for past harm. 
things like compensation for colonialism or for slavery. Um, this also comes with strengths and weaknesses, and maybe this is something to be discussed in the Q&A later on. All these are possibilities. Um, I, I just think they should come more to the foreground, at least, of discussions. Um, possibly more innovative or um, yeah, something with less of, um, of a history to it is automatic financing through taxes and fees and funding in global services. And so actually, I would just like to talk about this a little bit and leave out the other things here because I don't have time for that. The automatic financing, um, this is what the Brooklyn Commission called it, actually other um, institutions or other events have called it something different. As far as I could find, maybe I'm wrong, but this is the earliest I could find was in a habitat at the conference in 1976, where it was referred to as innovative fiscal measures to make development self-financing. Um, shortly afterward, James Tobin talked about a tax on currency transaction, something that has since been called the Tobin tax. Okay, the, the idea is that a tax, a global tax, is put on some form of global activity. The Tobin tax is, as I said, on currency transactions. Um, other uh, suggestions have said that this could be put on... Um, uh, on, on any uh, purchases of uh, stock exchange shows uh, stock in general. It could also uh, be used in order to use some form of global commons, um, like fishing in international waters, or to, to use the orbit when you put a satellite, something that are the commons and that so far is free because you're not paying anybody because these uh, resources or these, these areas don't belong to anyone. But there's no reason that it has to stay like that. Uh, you know, conceivably, uh, those people, corporations, countries, institutions that use these resources, resources could pay for that. Um, this is actually be, being developed to some extent after the Millennium Development Goals uh, were um, broadly accepted. Uh, there, there was a group that was called the Leading Group on Innovative Finance and Mechanisms um, came together in 2003, and it now has over 60 members, mostly governments. So there is a, a beginning has been made, but my impression is that it has not really gone very far. So the, um, there, there is an, an active effort to um, raise funding or raise fees on a number of activities. The, the most, the relatively most um, successful one has been uh, to, to levy charges on air tickets uh, in the idea that flying in itself is environmentally uh, destructive. And so uh, everybody who flies should automatically uh, contribute to that. This has indeed um, raised most funds, but the outcome, the, the latest number I could find is from 2012, which already tells you that it's not really gone very far is six billion dollars that is um that is one percent of global remittances at the moment so um it's not gone very far but i think it has important potential and it's it, it should no well, it deserves more attention in my view um the other example is that i would mention even though it's it has uh, received mostly negative press is COVAX. Um, this is an example of indirect redistribution in the sense that it's actually not money that is directly given uh, from the uh, rich to poor, but is that um, rich, again, stakeholders, usually uh, governments, but it could be whoever uses, makes use of something, could also corporations or people, um, finance something which uh, which goes into a global service of which uh, every from which everybody can um, benefit, and those who could not otherwise finance it themselves are the more important beneficiaries. So, COVAX was an idea that was developed uh, mainly by the WHO, but in cooperation with several other health institutions. And the idea was that it should uh, prevent what is going on right now at the moment. That is, it's mostly mostly those who can afford it that get vaccinated. Um, it has had, well, it depends on, you know, are you looking at the glass half full or glass half empty? Um, the half empty version is that um, it's, 
has not worked nearly as well as um, the organizers had hoped is that by far uh, most vaccines have actually been um, bought um, and by those who had the money to do this. Uh, the half full glass is that it exists at all. This is the first time in human history that something like that has existed. And uh, this, you know, this type of mechanism, and it is working. Um, it's, it could be better, but something is, is happening. So the last data here I could find, date from on the 8th of April, which says that 38 million doses have been delivered to 100 economies, including 61 developing countries who have not paid for it themselves. So again, glass half full, glass half empty. I'm looking at you know, beginnings that could be uh, increased. Another uh, possibility, something that was tried and also was unsuccessful at the time, was in Ecuador, uh, where the Ecuadorian government uh, suggested that instead of getting money for oil that was in a natural reserve, um, it would leave the oil in the ground if it got paid for leaving the oil in the ground. Um, this did not work out. The fund received only a fraction of the funding that was uh, required, and the contract to get the oil out of the ground was then given to, to a Chinese company. Um, I'm nevertheless uh, would like to mention this because I think this, this type of cooperation still has potential. And just because the first attempt ever to do this was unsuccessful doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be like that all the time. So these are my thoughts about this. And um, I would like to thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Aris, for a very thoughtful presentation. Uh, now I welcome all three of our guests to take a part in the discussion. We have received a, a couple of questions. Uh, I had a one uh, burning question in my mind actually for uh, Ashish or everyone that how we can understand a uh, degrowth, you know, uh, in current times when in colonial times we fight for a nation uh, in post-colonial, we fighting against nation and the majority is trying to capture the, you know, all the resources and try to uh, run the countries or the politics, all the things in their manner. So either you see a uh, current India or uh, Palestinian or Israel war and other continents also either in, a, uh, in, in, in Latin America, there is a Cuba is struggling against the embargo of America. In that world where are living the majority is is very powerful and so how we can articulate a degrowth in a global sense actually when we are saying that the, we should come together in terms of solidarity so again you want me to respond to this first and then we get yeah, to the, this is the question. Yeah, five, six questions in the chat how we can take up questions from the chat also first. Okay, so a uh, quick response to what you're saying, this is obviously a very complex uh, subject and we need much more time to discuss it. But I think what we're seeing right now also is a very toxic uh, combination of blend of neoliberal capitalist economics and uh, hyper-nationalism. Uh, certainly seeing this in India, but I think in many parts of the world where, you know, and this relates also to what Gabriel was saying about international trade, that uh, we've carved ourselves up into these nation states. Every one of them is competing in the globalized economy with each other, uh, competing in the mostly in the conventional sense of GDP growth and who can uh, capture uh, resources from where, uh, extract resources from where, etc., or do the kind of uh, uh, accumulation and, and capturing that Gabriel spoke about. So that's, and then that gets added on to by uh, uh, religious or other kinds of uh, nationalisms. Uh, what, for instance, what we're seeing in India right now. 
And so in that context, I think arguing for alternatives, and again, let me repeat, Tejinder is not just about degrowth, but any of these kinds of radical alternatives that we've been talking about is obviously very, very difficult. But this is precisely why we have to say that these alternatives are not about taking state power. They're not about saying, okay, let's get a leftist or a revolutionary party into power in, in India, and then everything will be okay. Because we've seen the experience with that in different parts of the world. It's really about saying that these radical alternatives are about people claiming power where they are, entering into dialogues with, with each other, creating the for of a respectful dialogue rather than conflict, um, showing, as is happening in many thousands of examples, showing how, in fact, a localized economy and politics can work with social justice uh, goals and uh, creating the uh, global networks that actually transcend nation state boundaries and attempt to create people to people relationships, people to people relationships of peace, of ecology, of uh, justice and so on. Very, very difficult, undoubtedly, but this is what we have to move towards, which also then means I think that we have to go beyond the United Nations. The UN has been a useful uh, forum for many things, including, for instance, international environmental law and human rights uh, uh, agreements and so on, but very, very limited and represented mostly and with the power of nation states uh, centered, it's centered around that. So how do we actually create also global people's assemblies where, in fact, uh, indigenous peoples, local communities, others who are self-defined are able to represent themselves for things that need to be done at a global level? So this is the kind of movements we'll have to work towards. But obviously, any response of this kind in two minutes is going to be very simplistic. It's obviously much more complex. Uh, we are running out of time. So there is a two, three questions I would like to first uh, take by the others, how can we assure that our indicators as HPI contributes to the push for alternatives rather than fixing existing models as an annex to models such as GDP that drive a growth oriented economy model? So in terms of just being a partial fix rather than alternative from the past, I'm having sense capability approach and the HDI in mind. I guess we can. Well, I'm not sure I totally understand the question, but if I did, the question was, how can we have alternatives? And this is basically what the three of us have been talking about. So these, I guess, are our suggestions about this. Okay, so another one is, is how do we integrate empowerment as a part of compensation? The whole idea is to reject income related indices would not be only financial redistribution for the, the capitalism. Ashish or Gabriel, anyone? Uh, Edith would like to address that. Yeah, again, I'm not totally sure I understand. So the question is, if we talk about financial redistribution, are we not strengthening a... Um, a discourse or a concept that we want to get away from. I, th that's a very valid question, if I understood it correctly. And I, I, I tried to mention that. I see that this is contradictory, um, or maybe not. Uh, I, just for the reasons that I mentioned is that I think uh, we shouldn't only talk about money, but I think we should also talk about money. I think, uh, you know, at a time when the inequality is as stark as it is today, we should, I don't think it's um, responsible to leave it out to talk about this. Uh, absolutely. I think if I may uh, compliment, I'll say that, uh, the, the, and, the, and, the, and then I think the, the point is like how not to address something that's so structural to define the, the power relations we, we, we have to, to fight against. How do financial systems shape all these um, uh, dynamics? That, uh, some, some of them I mentioned and so on, how, to, how not to do it. No, you just, what you do just, um, I think it's maybe, for, and then as a, the financial uh, 
sorry, uh, money somehow uh, uh, results in, in the power to claim uh, resources and to claim labor in this global market. No, so maybe we can address it like going around it, but in the end we have to talk all this um, kind of claims. No. Uh, if, if I may, I, I would like to pick one of the questions uh, and also some comments of the first things that Jindra uh, raised. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah? Okay. Um, I think I found it very interesting. You mentioned this uh, fight against the state uh, before a fight for the state and in, in, in dependent nations and then a fight against the state. And uh, I'm not really sure. I, I would say that uh, as far as I understand, I think in the the... Peripheral countries, the the the, the national this national question is not is not a solved issue as it is in in core nations. Somehow, uh, the, the, this the concept of a uh, um, dependency depends from dependency theory from Latin America is just idea of dependency is actually this uh, the denial of the full independence of these nations in the peripheral countries and how they are uh, with these power structures in the global uh, political system. They are also uh, subjugated to to the to the national other national states uh, to, for, for the more powerful states. So uh, somehow the populations in the south they have like a double layers of struggle where they have not only to fight their own uh, state but they are have also have to fight the, the 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 northern states. It's like double layers of of uh, of um, to use a Marxist term uh, of uh, for example for instance. For instance, of um, labor surplus and exploitation of labor, double layers of environmental exploitation, because you have to transfer these resources not only to supply your population's needs, but you have to transfer them to the core countries in the global market. So, I'm not sure uh, the fight for the state is concluded in these in the peripheral countries, because the autonomy and control over their uh, uh, to be outside of the sphere of the influence in the northern countries, this this is not completed, you know, as uh, as in uh, independent uh, uh, former imperial uh, powers, the uh, countries, the former colonial uh, states, uh, this is uh, they have the autonomy determined by their own military power and so on and so forth. Uh, and then maybe something I would like to ask to Ashish as a maybe a provocation since you raised this thing that uh, these movements, they're not about taking state power. Then I would um, ask you how these, uh, how these movements should address state powers. Just can, can they afford just to ignore state power or what, what's, how do you, how, how's this relationship uh, can, can be shaped you know, between these movements proposing alternative um, Building power somehow in uh, other in the independent spheres, but how do they address the uh, yeah the, the, the state structures? No? So yeah, I think Gabriel, I think that's that's a, that's a crucial question. Um, and uh, the way I look at it is that there's short-term goals and long-term goals. In the short-term, state nation states are here, and we have to try and make them more and more accountable, more uh, transparent. Uh, you know, all the stuff that we've been talking about better policies and opening up cracks in the system as much as we can, et cetera. Um, uh, for instance, right now, uh, demanding, uh, you know, uh, uh, free uh, and non-patented uh, vaccinations. That's a demand we're making of nation states that they should also try and push something like that through the United Nations. But in the long run, it seems to me that, it, uh, so what happens with this is that we tend to get stuck here and we just try and get more and more responsive states, but we know that there's a limit to how responsive a nation state can be because there'll always be centralization of power in, in some way. So in the long run, we have to also then fight for reclaiming the power to ourselves. And they, here also, I think the notion of what power is becomes very important. Not power over, that is not power to dominate, but the power with or the power to, that is the power to do things with other people in a good way. And uh, that's what radical democracy would be about. So I think we need to do both of these um, together. And so if we do that, and in the long run over, I don't know, three, four, five generations, if we're able to actually do that, as has happened, say, with the Zapatista and the Kurdish Rojava movement to some extent, then we can, in fact, talk about doing away with the nation state altogether or with a centralized state. So in some sense, kind of talking about uh, ecological anarchy, Anarchy used in the original sense, not in the distorted way people think about it. 
so I would kind of try and look at it like that: reform and revolution going together. But can I ask a something? A quick response. Then? Sorry, yes, please go. Yes, yes. May I? Because when you say the, the goal is to 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 claim power for ourselves, who who is that? I mean, your idea sh it sounds very local, um, you know, and, and that's that's fine. But it's you know, as a historian, I see that there there is one thing to have a movement and which draws people together who will, who share common goals. Usually there are some people who don't share those goals, who have other ideas. And as long as it's the movement, they can choose not to go there and they go someplace else. But what do you do when you, know, you, you have a larger entity and these people need to be integrated in some way as well? So if, if you have a plan for something that is not only for some locality and some other people can have some other locality, but you think this should be a plan for, for everybody instead of countries. Um, you know, what do you do with those people who want to have a large country? I mean, as I say, I live in China now. People here want a large country. That They are on the whole very happy with something that is happening the way it is. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I, since I don't live in China, I won't contest that, but I have lots of people there, especially those who work with the indigenous peoples of China who don't necessarily think like that. Um, and I wonder if the people who were originally displaced, the tens of millions who were displaced from their villages to make the industrial giant that China is, would have thought the same way, um, except that they never had a voice. So, but you're in China, so you, you know better. So I won't no, contest that. No, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, as but, you said, uh, this is a... Terrible simplification, of course. I'm not claiming everybody thinks the same way, but yeah, no, but I understand your question. So, you. yeah, no, I, I think the thing is that uh, one is it, it's important to, I think, realize that when I'm not talking about everything being just local, mm -hmm. uh, larger scales are important. That's why, for instance, I even talked about, let's say, people's assembly process at, at a global scale. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, Gandhi, for instance, spoke about something called oceanic circles. So, you have uh, the local assemblies or whatever at every, you know, that 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 local, the face-to-face -face interact scale. But then they're part of these larger and larger uh, entities, which perhaps, as I mentioned, could be at a biocultural regional level rather than the current uh, political boundaries in many cases. Um, and that is what then uh, governs or, uh, or creates the sort of larger scale interactions. Now, what I think is very important is that for the basic needs the local entity is self-reliant. I don't necessarily mean a single village. It could be 20 villages or 20 villages in a town or whatever, but, but there's some self-reliance for basic needs, right? And then built on that, there's larger exchange. There's cultural exchange. Maybe coffee is going elsewhere, et cetera, because everybody doesn't go coffee and you and I might still want it. But that larger exchange doesn't undermine the basic self-reliance that a local entity has. And so that's the economic level. And one can think of the same kind of thing at a political level. And this is where I think it's really important for us to understand, because the only ones I know of uh, this happening at scale are uh, the Zapatista and the Kurdish Rojava, or the Kurdish uh, ethnic movement, which is happening over fairly large scales, right? Tens of thousands of, or maybe a couple of million people. And so I think learning from that, where they've tried to do this with some degree of success, uh, and of course, some problems, uh, one would then say, okay, how would then the world look? Uh, what would the world then look like in that sense where larger scale interactions are not stopped and it's an open localization. It's also not the localization where I say that, no, this is my self reliance I'm not going to allow anybody from outside to come in on any refugees. Now, those who want larger countries, the question would be, do you want larger countries as in the current nation state or do you want a larger entity? of some kind to which you want to identify yourself with or for whatever reasons there might be. And that larger entity could be uh, a nation defined, for instance, by many indigenous peoples as themselves as nations. It could be a river basin, for instance, the Ganga river basin might consider itself to have some sort of an identity, etc. So I think this is the kind of reimagining that one would have to do uh, to, to that. But again, I don't have all the answers. And this is obviously somewhat simplistic. 
be good to have more discussions on this. I do we have a minute? I just wanted to do a quick response to the first question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can, yeah, please. So, which was this? I think question that came in about uh, what what is missing in the global north movements. I think some of it is what Gabriel and Iris have already spoken about. Now, but just to take that forward, I think first one of the most important thing is to look inwards. Uh, Ivan Illich, I think it was who once uh, told a group of American students who wanted to go and help uh, poor people in South America. He said, "If you want to go and help, please just stay where you are in your own university, um, because they don't need your help. What they need is for you to look at yourselves and see the problems you are creating in the global South." He didn't use the word global South, but he said that in America. Uh, if you're going to express solidarity and learn from them, yes, please, you're most welcome. Now, this is then looking inwards. What is the problem we are creating in the global south, which is through the kind of consumption patterns or production patterns or the kinds of accumulations that Gabriel spoke about? I think that is not happening nearly as much as it should. It's not there in the Green New Deals. as uh, uh, I've, I've seen, for instance, the Green New Deal in the U.S., uh, uh, amazing document in many different ways, but it's completely missing this whole element of the global north, global south inequality. Uh, and I'm glad uh, Gabriel brought that up. The second crucial part there is, I think, I mentioned it somewhat flippantly, but I'm serious about this. Why don't we see international conference on Swaraj in, I don't know, uh, Paris? Uh, but we see that uh, they're asking. I got asked this. I said, hey, let's do an international degrowth conference in, in India. I said, please, let's do an international alternatives conference, but let's not call it a degrowth conference. And this is not just about terms. This is about uh, worldviews, concepts. What, what do we think is important and legitimate and, and respect worthy? Um, this relates also then to the colonialism of language and the colonialism of concepts. Um, and even now, global interactions happen in English, Spanish, or French, which means all of us, you know, my native language is Gujarati. Why does the global north not think of learning some of these mother tongues from the rest of the world instead of having us uh, have to speak in English or Spanish or French, and then we get translators for those? So I think there's a lot of unlearning uh, that needs to be done by the global north if we really want truly equitable and respectful relationships. And the same applies within India, for instance, in the internal colonization that we have, where I am guilty of internally colonizing, for instance, rural areas from where I get my resources and on whom I impose my uh, cultures and my, my uh, ways of thinking and, and being. So there's that internal colonization part also, which we have to look at. Sorry, that became a bit long. Thanks. Thank you, Ashish. I would request Iris for a concluding remark because we are running out of time. If you could conclude the talk. Uh, I feel a little uh, a concluding remark. I guess the concluding remark is that uh, we need many more discussions like that and there are not the final answers. Is uh, to, to me, really, the most contentious, um, the, the, the concept that raises most questions of who's the North and who's the South. Um, this is something that to me has really been uh, up, up lifted or disrupted by, by my move from, the, from what is clearly the North in Europe to China. Um, but, you know, I went there because I was looking for a job there and, and I meet increasingly people who do that. And I meet increasingly people who learn Chinese. There are many now. And if conditions continue or if developments continue the way we have been doing, you know, we may be having very different discussions in 20 years. And, you know, Global South or Global North may not make that much sense anymore. Um, I think it's also important that we keep in mind what, what do we mean by the people and what do the people want? And people want very different things. And something that I've experienced twice is first from moving from West Germany to East Germany, and then again from Germany, I'm talking about myself a lot, to China, is that people who haven't had high living standards want this. 
many people want this, and I'm sure Ashishi will disagree and, and, and talk about many alternative um, projects, and I fully you know, believe they, they are there and they're important. But the what I've experienced repeatedly is the fervor with which people want something that they feel they haven't had so far. And I'm not, and the, the basic, we haven't talked about this, but to me, a, the, the basic problem is how to accommodate this wish that many people have um, in a world where probably this is physically impossible because of the limits of resources. So my biggest problem is how do I, as someone from the North, tell people um, who haven't had the living standard that I have had, you probably, it's impossible. You will probably never have that. And how do we translate that into a, you know, a respectful and responsible and creative discussion on how else do we create our lives that are good lives for everybody without at the same time telling all those people right now that they want a car and, and, and I want a freezer and, and a mobile phone um, that their views of what they want are wrong. I, I, I really feel that this is a problem that I have and that this, you know, Ashish, you were talking about this idea of degrowth. There's a certain degree of imperialism about this as well. And for me, I haven't really found a good solution for that. So my final word would be more of, of a problem than anything else. Okay. Thank Could you I just make a clarification about the term global north and global south? And you might correct me if I'm wrong, because my impression of this or my understanding of it is global north, global south actually is used in that way precisely to get away from the north-south geographical uh, thing. So, for instance, in Shanghai or me in Delhi or Pune is part of the rich, let's say the rich and the elite in Shanghai and in New Delhi are part of the global north, though they are in the geographic south. And that's the internal colonization bit that I'm talking about. Um, so I, I just wanted to try and clarify, yes, I, at least that's I, my I, understanding. Yeah. I understand that, but I think it is misleading. I think then really we should use a different terminology. Oh. Tejendra, I don't know if I have a right to a closing remarks. Yeah, yeah, okay. Then I would like to maybe try to come with some nuance to this. Okay, yeah, sure, sure. Can I? Always, okay. Uh, Yes. Yeah, there is always. Okay, nice. Thank you. Uh, first, I think uh, I would say that, uh, for instance, the, the data I brought about uh, ecologically unequal exchange, I think they bring a lot of insight to think of what is north and what is south. I mean, it's only this group of high income countries that managed to appropriate, uh, to have a, a positive appropriate, uh, oh my God, to English. Yeah, Ashish, it's so hard to express in English in a decent way. But anyways. Um, this group of uh, this high income group is the only group that is that manages to to appropriate resources from all the other parts of the world in all those categories I, I mentioned China for instance is the only group that has a difference in land so China manages to net to appropriate uh, land embodied in trade from uh, from other other regions of the world to have a net appropriation. Of course, there is exchange. The thing is like the surplus you acquire. And in this sense, China is somehow already a challenge for this uh, uh, north and south binary division in a global level. Of course. And then and then again, we can think of the, the internal uh, norths and south, but I think it's still useful to think of uh, national level, uh, I mean, th th this interstate system, because that's the state that's the, the system we are immersed. That's the ultimate level of enforcement where, where after on the top of that, it gets um, much more dependent on international relations with a totally different governance. So I don't think we can simply dismiss the national level to understand uh, this, this problematic. And on one hand, we have the, the, this, this material aspect of, of international trade that can help us to understand what is north and what is south and, and that's more or less what I, I was trying to bring in my in my in my presentation but on the other hand we also have this uh, political aspect of, of of autonomy and sovereignty and uh, also uh, the techno uh, technological difference which is for, for China is already uh, it's, it's somehow uh, it's a different position even though 
China is a net exporters of resources, it has some higher level of, of uh, sovereignty also for military power and so on and so forth. So uh, maybe it's not that uh, binary. I don't know how to, how to use this. But I would use this, I would keep using this binary uh, terms, for instance, to think about uh, ecologically unequal exchange. I think it's hard to deny that. Uh, from, from data I, I, I try to show in this thing. And uh, just one last thing I would like to address one of the questions that remind me a little bit of the story Ashish told about the volunteers uh, in, in Latin America. Uh, the funny thing is the story I heard in a, in a, in a talk from Vijay Prashad, your countryman, and uh, he tells the story about, I think, the, the revolution, the communist revolution in Vietnam. And they have this uh, commission coming from from uh, Italy. I don't know if it's a it's an anecdote or is a real story, but you have this commission coming from Italy, from the Communist Party of I Italy, and say, "Oh, we'd love to support the co the the communist revolution in Vietnam and all your 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 victories against imperialism and against uh, capitalism and so on. How can we support? How we Italians can support the the Vietnamese revolution?" And then the Vietnamese say, "Okay, go back to Italy." And make your own uh, communist revolution there. No? So you can take this imperial burden from from, that, from us once you as workers or I don't know who, who is the uh, the subject there have the power to decide on this macro level structures on how countries relate to each other. So um, and I think for de for degrowth uh, it's somehow uh, if degrowth wants to build uh, solidarity with what we are calling global south here from the national continental perspective then i think uh, the point is looking at as imperial powers as uh, uh, people people living in in in, in uh, this um in this core what can we do how can we uh, destroy the structures from the within and this means building solidarity i think uh, much more than just uh, sympathy for alternative cosmologies in, in a sense, and sometimes in a very romantic way, just uh, that I see very often in uh, degrowth discourses. Uh, so yeah, I would say that this global solidarity is, can, can be built more in this, in this sense, like tackling uh, trade agreements, tra tackling uh, war, and so on and so forth. Gabriel. Uh, Ashish, do you want to say something? It's no, I think I've said enough. I, I already responded. I mean, there were many other questions to which we could have responded, but I think we're if you want well to over time. One, uh, if you wish to. Uh, so I think there was one on... Uh, wait, let me see. Now. I've actually written it down. I can't see it anymore. Um, No, I, I mean, I think the the, the uh, issue of, I mean, maybe just picking up on, on Gabriel's last point about solidarity, uh, to me, this uh, is absolutely crucial. And it's solidarity based on mutual respect. So that we're, uh, and that mutual respect can also be uh, constructive criticism. And there, I agree, so that we're not, you know, just because something is coming from the global south doesn't necessarily make it uh, the truth and just because it's coming from the global north doesn't necessarily make it imperialist or whatever. So I think it's being able to have much, much more, uh, much deeper conversations, um, much more uh, conversations where, where we're listening, it's not just debates. And unfortunately, we live in a world in which that's become very rare. We're just rushing around all the time, right? I mean, either we were physically rushing around pre-COVID or now we're rushing around from one webinar to the other. And so the ability to actually be able to uh, talk at time scales that are human and not digital is so, so important for movements. Uh, for me to understand, for instance, what the Kurdish women are doing is not just about listening for an hour uh, to a presentation. It's really being able to understand and question each other and keep questioning and understand and then and build solidarity on that basis. And if we do that, I think we'd be much more powerful collectively than uh, because otherwise we end up with a lot of superficial or uh, misunderstandings also when, when things happen at this mad pace.
that which we are working. How do we do that? I'm not sure, but I think that's a challenge we should try and figure out. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you for your comments and participation and very uh, convoluted presentations, uh, which has raised a lot of questions. I guess those who are watching also or for me, uh, and I would like to thank to everyone on the behalf of uh, Summer School Barcelona that you have given your uh, crucial uh, critical time from your daily work. And uh, there is uh, another announcement for a uh, people who is watching that uh, on June 17, we are going to uh, deliver our sixth webinar on exploring degrowth policy proposals, advancing the transitions pathways. So please keep tuning to the this YouTube channel. Those are watching on YouTube. Thank you. Thank you, Tejendra. Thanks, Gabriel. Thanks, Thank Iris. Thank you very much. Luka, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you it is Ashish, to organization, Tejendra.